Now, from the World Bank to the helm of the United Nations Environment Program, Inger Andersen has had quite an illustrious career in the development sector. She boasts over 30 years of experience in international development, economics, environmental sustainability, and policy making. As a new executive director of UNEP, she takes on the role of championing the global environmental agenda. We sat down with Inger a week after she settled into her new office as she shared her vision for UNEP and how she intends to use environmental diplomacy to change attitudes and behaviors around the world on tonight's Her Say. Now, when we look at the case of the environment, especially where Kenya stands, we of course have hosted UNEP for four decades now when you think about it. Uh, quite a long relationship. Um, in terms of the efforts that have been made by the Kenyan government for the environment, where do you think Kenya stands in comparison to its counterparts on the continent? Oh, Kenya's done a really great job. Uh, let's, let's talk about plastic for a moment. Kenya was amongst the very first countries globally to ban uh, single-use plastic bags. And as I was landing uh, on Saturday evening, it was announced, um, you know, this is an illegal, uh, uh, you can't have single-use plastic bags. And I notice around town, everybody has their carry bag. Um, this, is, this is one example, but I would also add that, you know, some 10, 15 years ago, Kenya began to invest in geothermal energy. To date, Kenya has invested more than a billion dollars in geothermal energy. Yes, with uh, support from international agencies, but this is a Kenyan government commitment. Supplying energy more than to Nairobi is what uh, the geothermal plants provide. And of course, Kenya has invested a lot in off-grid solar. And today, more than one million households are connected to off-grid solar. Uh, Mkopa, I think it's called. So, so all of these are really showing that there are solutions. And so Kenya has a lot to show, not just the developing countries, but the whole world. And let's talk about a segment of society, the urban poor who tend to bear the biggest brunt when it comes mm -hmm. to um, environmental damage. Mm -hmm. uh, and many times you'll find, especially in Kenya, they you know, seem to be more taken by the daily worries of, can I afford school fees or rent and food for my children? And environmental issues tend to take a back seat. Yes. How do we make it a priority for them from where they stand in understanding those policies. I'm so glad you asked this because that is the core issue that we all need to own and address wherever we sit. Um, the urban poor or the poorer segments of our societies must not feel that they are being left behind. And that's why the Paris Agreement, for example, speaks about a just transition. So as we transition to a cleaner, greener world, nobody can be left behind. There has to be justice around this. And the Sustainable Development Goal speaks about leave no one behind. Now, what does that then mean in reality? It means that the story around urban development and environmental matters are actually one and the same. The urban poor need to have the green spaces, the urban poor need to have affordable housing, but that housing must be sustainable. Uh, we need to ensure that open sewer sanitation, which causes not just um, disease, uh, but also environmental problems, are addressed. We need to ensure that flying toilets are no longer uh, in existence because that causes disease as well as environmental problems. We need to ensure that um, water supply, a clean water supply is available. So all of those things are an urban issue that addresses the priorities of urban poor but also very much a, um, an environmental issue. And there are real opportunities within those elements for job creation, for small businesses as well. And speaking of which, in terms of opportunities, who then would take the lead in forwarding a lot of these environmental policies and sustainability? Because you've seen around the world, sometimes cities take the lead more so than national governments. Um, oftentimes communities would also. So in your view, for, for Kenya's case and in our context, which party would probably be able to forward this agenda much faster. I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a symphony, if you like. Everybody needs to step in. And I think you will find communities here in Kenya where exactly that is happening. Maybe it has been a local um, community that has voiced their concern early and powerfully. Maybe it has been um, a, a politician or a local government that has raised this. Or maybe it has been the enabling policies by government, central government. Each of these need to act in accord or in harmony with one another. 
but it is about raising our collective voices. And, and as we know, um, urban poverty is, is or poverty reduction and eradication of poverty is the number one sustainable development goal. That's what we have to do and we must not uh, ignore this at any cost. Um, and, and the opportunities that this provides are, are much larger than what maybe we think. Think about the small businesses for energy to waste, uh, 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 waste to energy for example. Think about um, water supply services or sanitation services. Uh, People are willing to pay for this like they're willing to pay for their mobile phone. And so um, willingness to pay, many service, many as assessments have been done that there is a willingness to pay for these services. The services just have to be enabled and, and provided. We just wrapped up the UNEA meeting in March this year and a lot was said, a lot of commitments were made. And a lot of times the perception is that um, they, the policies are left at that level. Mm -hmm. And hardly ever do they trickle down to the ground where they actually need it in terms of seeing that change. Um, how do you think the UN can really help in forwarding and, and making sure that they keep accountable to what they said they would do? Uh, bearing in mind that the UN is not an enforcing body. <laughs> they don't police nations and it's more on a voluntary basis mm -hmm. that they come and make these commitments. But how do we actually get them to so, commit? So this is a really great question because the UN is made up of nations. Nations make these commitments. We are but the servants of those nations and we have to be expressing the will of those nations and providing the science, the normative, the policy uh, suggestions. At the end of the day, uh, when these decisions are taken, they have to be owned at the national level, facilitated and supported by the United Nations. And here I would say the United Nations Secretary General, as well as the Deputy Secretary General, whom I understand you, you had a nice interview with recently, uh, when she visited during UNIA, um, are pushing very hard for a reform of the United Nations, such that we work much more in accord. And that's a real opportunity to support better with greater efficiency, with more impact, with greater results, uh, the nations whom we serve. And, and so how do we, uh, through the other agencies, our job as UNEP has to be to infuse environment into the other agencies and the other agencies to infuse their mandate into ours. And that's what we have to do to be even better than we are today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, 